between us and the Lord. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're in your word. Help us to uh, <clears throat> set everything aside for the time being to be with you and your word and your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, help us give us insight into this church, into these believers, um, so we know how to, in this case, stay away from them. <laughs> I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, um, Lady to see, if you remember, is in the Lycus Valley next to Colossae, and if you know where, remember where we were on the map, where we had Ephesus down here when we started, we're all, all the way over here, and it's about 90 miles away, so it's about 90 miles east of it, about the same height, or latitude I suppose that would be, um, and it was a very, it was a medical center, and um, one of the things that comes up here is, is uh, Calarium is an eye salve that they used, that they developed uh, uniquely in Laodicea. And some of the, the things that are, are about, um, about Laodicea, the Lord uses as a, as, a, as a, He uses both that one and the fact that they always get lukewarm water <laughs> uh, as, as a way of teaching them a lesson about themselves so they can get a better, it's kind of like a parable, is that many times when you're given a parable, you get the spiritual lesson better. And so that's what, that's what he utilizes in here. Now, the, the place where the water came from was Heropolis. And it's in the Lycus Valley. So there was Heropolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. And Heropolis was where the hot water springs were at. And as they flowed, they went through Laodicea. And by the time they got to Laodicea, they were warm. Okay? And that water was, it, it, they used it for what's called a, uh, um, an emetic. An emetic? An emetic. Yeah, an emetic. And it would, the reason being is that not only was it warm water, which is disgusting, <laughs> but it was very high in mineral content. But as it went through there, it went to Colossae, which had cold water. So because of where they're uniquely located, they could not change the, the um, they couldn't change the water so they got anything other than lukewarm. Okay, so their their particular church in Laodicea was a very rich area for dyes and and um, for dyes and for uh, their sheep and and things like that. And we and if you remember that stuff, so let's get into the verse, verse fourteen. This is kind of the uh, we're not going to spend as much time on this. It says to the angel, which is the pastor at the church in Laodicea, write. These are, these are the words of the Amen. And um, let's just stop there for a second because it kind of tells us about Jesus. It says the Amen, the faithful, and the true witness. And this word Amen, we know that that's a Hebrew word. It's also the Greek word. It's also the English word. It's always just transliterated. But what it means is um, it is true. Okay? And what it's really speaking about here as Jesus Christ being the truth um, and um, the truth of God. So that's what that is. And the faithful one always, Jesus is faithful and he's a true witness. And the ruler of God's creation. And this is not only the creation of the original creation, but this is the exact same word that in Corinthians it says that you are a new creation. Meaning that the church itself is a new creation um, uh, in mankind. It's, they are unique from all other uh, human beings that are made. Uh, that's in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17. So it's including that too as be, obviously being the ruler of the church. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither, neither cold nor hot. And this part of knowing, we're familiar with that. That's the omniscience of God, in this case Jesus Christ, his deity. And he's saying that you are neither hot, nor, neither, you're neither cold nor hot. And he says, I wish you were either one or the other. And the, the reason for that is that the, the, the cold part here is, um, he says, I know your Christian production. He says, I w you're neither cold nor you're hot. 
and the hot part, we've talked about this before, is the mature believer. And in verse 21, we'll get to it, they are the nikao. Okay, so he defines what they are. And the warm one, we'll get to that one, but the cold one is an unbeliever. It's somebody who's cold. And then he, the word here is when he says, I wish, the Greek word says, it's an unattainable wish. And so the question is, why is it an unobtainable? What makes it different than these two? Okay? And it really it drives you to the, to the principle of the reason that this one, they, that Jesus here is saying, I wish you were, but you're not, is, is an unobtainable wish that he has um, that will not be fulfilled. Okay? And the reason being, and this is really kind of interesting, I think, is that it's easier to, to evangelize an unbeliever than it is to make a warm believer hot. Okay? And one of the reasons that's true is because it involves volition. Okay? And not just this volition. This volition, uh, when, when a person becomes a believer, if you remember what happens is that they have a zeal that comes from that. But what happens with this one, this person here has... Has, um, there's a piece in Peter where it says to that when you, when you know the Word of God and you become a believer and you get it clear and then you back away from it, it is even more difficult, very difficult, to come back to that same thing again. Okay? And that's the principle here is because what they have done, in reality we know them as uh, carnal believers. You know? They're carnal. Um, that comes from the word, and it comes from the, the word in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but we've come to know that as the word cosmic, which means worldly believer. And which means this, what's happened is that unlike the unbeliever, when the unbeliever becomes saved, before he becomes saved, he only has cosmic viewpoint. Okay? All he has is worldly input, uh, viewpoint. He has nothing else because he, he can't have a spiritual viewpoint or doctrine. But what happens with this one here, he has actually had Bible doctrine, he has actually come up, and then, then what happens, he has discarded it. Okay? And what happens, he is now full of evil thinking. Okay? He has completely accepted it. So you can see why this is really a different thing, and this is why the Lord says, I, I, wish you were, I wish you were one or the other. At least if I could start here, I would have a shot at it, because then you're just ignorant of spirituality. But the warm believer is, is actually very familiar with, with it and has rejected it, okay? So that they, they are much harder to, to convert and to change. And I think if you've seen this in Christianity, you don't see many people who have become um, um, carnal, cosmic, who are indifferent, you see very, very few of them ever make a decision to go to spiritual maturity. Okay? And what happens is a, there's a word in the Greek, it's called matayotis, and it means, to be, it means uh, to be a vacuum. And it's caused by a scar tissue. So the scar tissue on, on the soul here uh, makes it such that they are immune to the voice of the Holy Spirit, okay? We, we, we see this called, uh, when it's quenching. This is the part where the quenching of the Holy Spirit takes place, okay? And the quenching of the Holy Spirit is when you've gone far enough away from God that when the Holy Spirit tries to speak to you, 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 you have shut Him off and you no longer listen to Him. So many times when you have a believer, it is harder to get them motivated and to have that uh, renewing of that love for Christ to move into maturity. Um, then the people who have already made that decision, many times th this is because they are not actually interested. Okay? It, and one of my notes here is that it's my personal belief that about 80% of all believers that I've met in the United States fall into this category. They just really don't care. They're indifferent. They're actually in the first stage of, of the cosmic system, which is indifference towards Bible doctrine. And, and ultimately, because they have indifference um, 
they, they um, actually ignore Christ. Um, so the, uh, let me see, where are we at? Foreknowledge, da da da, 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 da okay, nerves and cold. Um, and and the, the, the part that's funny here is that he's playing on the fact that this word here, remember I was telling you that Heropolis, Heropolis is here, um, Heropolis is here, it's H-E-I-R-A-P-O-L-O-S, I think it is, I mean city. And then Laodicea is here, and Colossae is here. He's telling them, remember how it's hot, it's warm, and it's cold, is that the water flows this way. And what he's really kind of making a joke to them is that you obviously cannot be, you cannot be, uh, you, you cannot go from lukewarm to cold because uh, you can't go to being an unbeliever, okay? So they are here, and his desire for them to change is that even he, he, the model is where they live. And the model says that there's no way that they can change this water from warm to hot or warm to cold. They're stuck with it, okay? And, um, and that's, that's, so that's kind of the, the tongue-in-cheek joke that he's making for them, is that you're just like, you're just like the water you drink, you know? <laughs> that you're, you, can't, you can't go either way. Um, let me see. And, and, and as we know, you know what, one of the things that's happened is that we, we talked about this before, where Bible doctrine is a compass, okay? And you have cold over here, which is the unbeliever, and you have the, the hot over here, well, you have the warm over here, in this case, and you have the hot here. So, by, as believers, when we continually, daily, uh, allow the Word of God to be part of our lives, and we meditate on it day and night, all those scriptures that you're familiar with, it, it, keeps, us, it keeps us from going, going away from it. Okay? But when you stop it, you, you go this direction. And this happens because Satan is always trying to put worldly things in your life. It is, it is your volition and your desire to learn the Word of God that keeps your compass straight. On, on, the, on the holy life that God desires of you. So, that is always true. One of the notes I made here last time is that in the church, morality has, has become the enemy of holiness. Okay? Christians believe that morality is, is critical. And because they focus on morality, in reality, they don't know the doctrine of holiness. Okay? Now, if they really desired to know it, the Lord would provide it. But in reality, is, they, is that they, do not, they don't desire it. So they're stuck there. Uh, verse 16. He says, So, consequently, would be another word, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, we, we know that the, the you here is talking about the cosmic believers, okay? And it's Jesus here talking about it. It says, because you're not either one of them, I can't do anything with you. I've presented all of my information to you, and you have rejected it, okay? The, um, the piece here where it says spit out of my mouth is not the word spit out. It's actually the word for vomit, okay? It's, it's the word to vomit something out. And this is the, like I said, this is the part that, to, that goes to the part where they live again. That in, re in reality, the water that they had, they had a great medical center there because the Romans believed that uh, vomiting up things actually could make you better. In reality, it doesn't. It destroys your body chemistry. But, um, but that's what they believed. And so the, the Lord is actually kind of making a, you, you, you heard me use this word last week, a paranomasia. He's using a, he's using a tongue-in-cheek joke to kind of poke at them, uh, to help them understand him, to understand what's going on here. And it says that, this is actually a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a present active indicative. It means that they keep on, uh, he keep, the Lord keeps on wanting to throw them up. And it's only his grace and his patience that, that doesn't, uh, 
that, and, that, and the, the equivalent to the spitting up, the vomiting, is to send them to death. Okay? Uh, just so you know what that is. But I think you, we're familiar with that one. Um, let's go to the next piece. Verse 17. He, and he says, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. And I do not need anything. Now what happens is that the Lord himself is looking into their mentality. And he is quoting here. The Greek here says it's a quote. It actually uses the word hoti. Which is... Uh, which we use as the word, you know, it's usually the word that or because, but when you use it in this sense, and you, you kind of, uh, you're putting in quote symbols where it's at. Because he uses it twice. He uses it on the first part of the verb and the end of the verb, so you know that this is the Lord looking into the mentality of these, of these carnal believers here, and he's quoting what they say. And the word here says, and the, the, the verb here is that they keep on saying it. Okay, and the word rich here, uh, I have acquired, I am rich, is a perfect tense. So it means that they really are rich. Okay, they really are very wealthy. The people who are doing this are very wealthy. And they keep on saying this to themselves. I am very wealthy and I don't need anything. Now the interesting thing to me about this is that they probably, when they first became believers, they actually were maturing. And one of the results many times in spiritual maturity is that God does allow you to have wealth because what you do follows the divine establishment exactly. And by doing that, you accumulate wealth. Okay, just as a result of that. Why? Because that's that sowing and weeping principle that we find in the divine establishment. So many, many believers, when they, when they first become believers, they start doing things God's way. And as a result of that, God builds their wealth. He finds a way to bless them. And so... That's most likely, and the word wealth here is not just, it is the same word that we use for rich man in the Greek, but it also means that they have prosperity in every aspect. So that means that they have, uh, they have title, they have position, they have everything that goes with that. So they are indeed very, very wealthy. And, and the truth is, from a human point of view, which is the one they've adopted, they don't need anything. They no longer need God anymore. And this is a very common spot um, for, for people, is that unless you stay with Bible doctrine, Bible doctrine makes you humble by its very presence in your, in your mentality. Okay, it balances you out. And what happens, is, what happens is if you don't have it or you don't stay in it, as you prosper because of your walking with God and, 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 and doing things God's way, which is divine establishment, what happens is that you start thinking it's about you, that you did something, and you start taking on that, um, uh, that arrogance, that, yeah, I am this good, I, I am this good. You forget about God because now you have all the things and you don't, and you don't have needs. Uh, that, interestingly enough, that is actually where Satan would love to have believers because they're neutralized. As you can see here, they're, they're totally neutralized. So that's where, that's where uh, they are at. With this thing here, and it is a cosmic viewpoint, and they and they and they and it tells them that they keep on having this viewpoint. They don't change it um, at all, and they become insensitive to the calling of the Holy Spirit, and they've been they become insensitive to the Word of God in their in their lives. What they have done, and this is pretty common, people, uh, and, and I've talked about it before. It is much more common for somebody to fail the prosperity test than to fail the adversity test, okay? It's because when you have adversity, it kind of drives you to your knees, okay? But what happens when you, uh, when you have prosperity, it tends to not make you think about those things, okay? So the most common failure in Christianity is the prosperity test. When, when God starts cleaning up your life and things start changing, you, you, lose, you lose that perspective. And that's where they're at. They've, they have failed the uh, prosperity test. Um, okay, but you do not realize, and the word isn't realize here, the word is to know, okay? You do not know this truth. And then he starts with, with some, uh, a predicate nominative. He says that you are, and whenever you see you are and you see the A-R-E, that's like an equal signs. So that's why I put it up over here. It says, I am rich in their thoughts. 
They are wealthy in every way. They have no needs. And Jesus says to them, you are, um, and he's talking about the, this cosmic church. In reality, this, this, if you're familiar with this, you've had a chance to read it before, God, the Lord Jesus does not say one good thing about them. Nothing. Not one. So it means that this church is significantly that way. This does not have any who are walking with, with Christ in it. Okay? From everything that shows us here. And what it says, that he, uh, uh, um, this, a predicate nominative is when you say that, when you say God is love, that's a predicate nominative. It means God equals love. Okay? And what Jesus is saying here, and these are some of the words we'll go into a little deeper, he says, you are, cosmic believer, you are miserable. You're despicable. You are spiritually poor. You are blind and you're naked. Okay? So this is all this is this is his assessment of this church. Um, in reality, what they have really done, and this is common too, is that they have uh, taken something that is just a um, what is it? It's just a tool. It's just a detail of life. You've taken money, wealth, and position, and you made it something that, from God's point of view, it should never be, because it, it will move you away from God, which is what it's done with this one. Okay? In reality, money, position, title, all of those, as a Christian, um, knowing that Christ gave us those things, we always have to treat them like they're a detail. Okay? And that doesn't mean be disrespectful. God never says be disrespectful about money. Nor does he ever condemn wealth, ever. There is zero condemnation in wealth. What there is in wealth, like we talked about on Sunday, is that there is a, there is a piece in it that, uh, that is very attractive to people. Um, in reality, it's a stumbling block to many. But if you understand that it is a, um, that in reality, money and wealth is a trust that God has given to you to use in a prudent and proper way. And you treat it like anything else in your life. You treat it like your health. You treat it, you treat it with good stewardship, with good principles, and you apply those, and you let what happens to it happen to it. But it's never, it's never your job to do anything other than be an excellent steward of it. Okay? I think that's what we've always talked about. These are really tests that, that the Lord has put in their life for them to go up. But rather than up, they went down. Okay? And they ended up getting involved in the devil's world. Now the word, um, the first word that's on there is wretched. That is actually the word miserable. And miserable comes from, uh, what happens is that when you have uh, a lot of something, uh, wealth, position, or something like that, when you don't have what we have come to call capacity, you lose the ability to be thankful for it, okay? You lose the uh, ability in your soul to in truly enjoy it as a blessing. And what it becomes is a, a cursing. And that cursing is like a hunger that you can't satisfy. So even though they have lots of wealth, in reality, they keep telling themselves they have a lot of wealth to reassure themselves. Because in reality, they don't have the assurance that God is in their life like, like somebody who is mature. The um, next word is the word um, despicable I used. It actually means to, be, to, to not to be happy and to be pitied. The word poor, this is one, one that, he, that they use in this translation here, means beggarly, impotent, and it is a, uh, is a, a metaphor for spiritually deprived, to have no spiritual strength. So that's what happened to them, is that they don't have that. They depend on the things that they have. Um, the next word there is blind. And this is, a, this is to mean uh, to have no perception. And if, since they have no perception of, of, of spiritual truths, of Bible doctrine, in reality they cannot apply them. They have, no, they have no resource to supply. You know how the tree always has the water? So it always has the minerals and always has the water. They are like somebody who lives in a desert. Okay? And if you know the pieces, I think it's in Jeremiah, where he talks about people like this, carnal believers, are like people who live in a desert that has salty soil around it. They, they're just starving to death out there. Uh, it also means to be blind and to be mentally spiritually blind, specifically. Um, and the last word to be naked, 
Um, this means that this means to have um, the, we called it the uniform of glory. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, um, when you walk with the Holy Spirit, you have this, you actually have a um, kind of a, a spiritual robe. We've called it the, the, the robe of glory before. And it's because that your soul is actually surrounded and controlled by God the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of similar to the, to the, to the soul with the Shekinah glory. But it has a, a, a presence to it that the Lord is saying here, in reality, you don't walk in the Holy Spirit, you are naked. Okay? Um, and he says, I counsel you. This is Jesus giving them advice. Okay, that's over here. Um, he says, I counsel you to buy from me. Okay, why from him? It's because Jesus is the one who has the mind of Christ. Uh, gold refined in fire, okay? And the, the, the fire is the fact that Scripture is refined in fire, it is the purest of the pure. And the gold here is up here. So he says, buy or invest, that's what the verb means. Gold, remember this one, gold here? This is 1 Corinthians 3.12. Gold, silver, and precious stones. These are the things that have intrinsic value, just like... Over here, when we use the word agathos for production, Christian production, has intrinsic value that is eternal. Um, then he says here, it says, so that you may become rich. Now this is to become something you weren't before. So it means that they're going to go from here, so they may become rich and go up here. That's his recommendation. Um, he says you may become rich and white clothes to wear. Now this white clothes to wear is a metaphor for the verse that was before it, to be clothed. It's not, it doesn't say a white robe, it says white clothes. Okay? And what it means is that in the filling of the Holy Spirit, it has this Shekinah glory that has the, the, the light of God in it. So he's telling them to walk in, walk in, the, walk in the Spirit. So he's telling them, these are the two things I recommend for you, is to become rich, which becomes spiritually prosperous and spiritual wealth, and, and to do that, to walk in the Holy Spirit. And then he says here, he says, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. Now he's talking about in time right now. He's not talking about in the future, he's talking about in time. He's telling them, he's, he's using a different word than he won be, won before we said naked. He said to cover your shameful nakedness. Okay? In this case, the shameful nakedness is the fact that they are not filled by the Holy Spirit, nor do they ever. They have abandoned it. Okay? So they are shamefully naked from God's point of view. And he says, um, and salve, he's talking about buying salve. Okay? And this is a joke for that one. The only place that they had this um, stuff, the word is, the Greek word is, where is it? It's chlorium. And that was the name of it. They, they don't have it anymore. It's, it's been lost in history. But whatever it was, and when they had an eye disease, they would put chlorum on it, and it would heal their eyes so they could see again. Okay? And so this is, what the, this is what the Lord's using here. He says, put salve, and that word salve is chlorum. Okay? It's the word for this salve. Um, and to put it on your eyes so that you can see. Okay? And what he's really using this is that by, by following this recipe here to, to be rich spiritually. And how do you become rich spiritually? You bathe yourself in the Word of God. You, you choose it. You actively choose it to be in my life. I'm going to use it to apply. It's not that you're never going to fail because we know that we as Christians fail in sin. It's that you're going to, you're going to come back to remembering the Word of God. You're going to bathe in the Word of God. You're going to choose the Word of God. You're going to remember the Word of God. Why are you going to remember the Word of God? It's because you expose yourself to it day and night so that you're careful to do everything written in it, right? That's what that piece is for. So, um, that, that's what that piece is. Um, yeah, it's a, a powerful power. And, this, and that is one so that if you do these things, what is the result of doing these things? What is the result of spending time of purchasing gold. That, that's the Word of God said you can apply it. Then what's the purpose of becoming rich spiritually? What's the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that in reality you can therefore see and therefore you are not blind and you can apply and, and fulfill 
the plan of the Lord and so become victorious. Okay? And the other way, there's a word in here, the, one, the, 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 uh, the word in here is to uh, put it in your eyes. The word is actually to rub it in your eyes. And if you think about what happens is that, it's a, it's a really unique way he puts this there. He, sa he says to rub it. So what happens is it doesn't cure, if you're familiar with stuff like that, it doesn't cure you immediately, but you rub it over in time. And one of the reasons you do that, it's very similar to the way that you, that you purify your soul, is that you do it over time. You don't, you don't, there's no quick fix. And, and this, is one of the, this is one of the flaws that we see in church is that let's go to the mountaintop experience and we're going, to be, we're going to be different from now on, you know. And in reality, that is never God's, that's never God's way of doing it. The way of God's doing it is plugging away day after day, moment after moment, trial after trial, uh, scripture after scripture, principle after principle, application over application, over time, slowly and surely. But be transformed by the renewing of your word. Um, and that is so that you understand doctrine and to apply it. Um, we're going we're gonna to go to 19, but we're going to really pick up the rest of it. I just want to read the rest of it. Because these, these are, what he says between here and 21 are actually axioms. Okay? Uh, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Okay? Uh, and that's what he's doing here. This love right here is a personal love. And it's also a continual love because it's in the present active indicative. I continue to love you personally because you're mine. That's really what that, that's what we are as believers. <clears throat> and I rebuke you when you need rebuking. And I discipline you when I discipline you. So he's telling him, his, his thing here is that to be, it says, so be earnest and repent. And what that really says, the word is not earnest. The word is be zealous. Okay. And to change your mind. Change your mind about where you're at and go towards me. He's given them the recipe for it. Okay? Uh, verse 20. <clears throat> the most misunderstood verse in, in, in the Bible. <laughs> right? Uh, Here I am, Jesus is speaking. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. This is not. This is used as the most common phrase for evangelism, and it is not evangelistic at all. This is restoration. How do we know that? It's because he is speaking it to the church and the Christians of Laodicea. It cannot be an evangelistic verse without completely violating the context. So what he's telling them, on the heels of what he's already told them already here, is that, Knock, I stand at the door, I knock. I, I, I want you to answer this. I am appealing to you. The act of volition on these people's part is to open that door. Okay? They have to open the door. Right? If we sin, God cannot forgive that sin in time unless we repent of that sin. 1 John 1, 9. And that's what it's saying here. Is that in reality, the Lord wants to bring them back he knocks on that door, but they have to make the choice to come back. Okay? <clears throat> and, the, and the piece there where it says, uh, I will come in and eat with that person, and they will at me. That's the fellowship of, of, of Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the Shekinah glory of Christ in me, becoming the light of the world, and walking in the light and that truth of the Holy Spirit. That's what that is in a nutshell. So th these are axiomatic at this point. Um, verse 21, where we get back here, okay? <clears throat> now this is really interesting to me because it, 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 it has a kind of a double parallel to it. It says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, the, the words here are exacting, okay? He's really saying, the, the one who is victorious, this is an axiom, it's talking to everybody, obviously not to them, although they have the potential if they choose to take the step up to be hot and pursue maturity, because that's the nakao, okay? And this word is the verb makao, it's used twice. He says, those who are the victorious ones 
which are mature believers, right, are, are on the exact same basis. He uses the same verb. Our victorious one is Jesus Christ. The overcomer, the one who is the overcomer, will be like the overcomer. Okay? The one who is the victorious one will be the victorious one. And I, I look at it as that was, this is the very meaning of Christianity and, and, and its truest sense. This is the plan of God. The plan of God is for the victorious one, okay, and small o-n-e, to be like the victorious one, Christ, for the same reason, okay? Those who overcome the world can fulfill, okay, fulfill the plan of God. And what did Jesus do? He fulfilled his Father's plan. So therefore, they are exacting. Okay? They're the same. That's why he says that. He says, those who, are, those who follow the Lord's plan and are like me will be like me when I shared my throne with my Father. So this is talking about, if you're familiar with this verse, is that the, the time frame that he's talking about sharing the throne is when Jesus has a real throne on earth which will be during the millennium, that he will share to those people uh, by giving them the authority. Just as he was victorious and he sits on the God the Father's throne in heaven. <clears throat> and then all these other things, that this, this last piece here is axiomatic again. He who has ears, let him hear, right? Um, yeah. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. And this is the same thing as that you learn from Bible doctrine being taught. And he's talking to the churches here. And that's what I have with the lesson. Note that all these things are parallels, especially this piece over here. These are actually parallels to what we talked about on, um, on Sunday. And this piece right here to me is one of the most important pieces is that this is the part that tells us that those who will truly share in the, um, in the things of the Lord will only be those who are mature. Why? Because they are victorious. They are in the ka'o. They are victorious by being the mature believers that he is, he is encouraging them to go to. So did I, give you, did I give you too many answers that you don't have any questions? <laughs> I have one. Oh, yes. The first 21, uh, they have two words, victorious, and two sits and thrones. So is that reference second advent and heaven? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, second, the, the second advent one is for Christ, okay? Uh, I mean, for heaven is Christ, and second advent one is for us, okay? Because at the second advent, the millennium starts, in reality, the only people who will rule with him will not be all Christians, will, will only be the ones who are, who are spiritually mature. Yeah, Nikao, exactly. And, and I, like the, I like the way he, um, that, the Lord sets up a parallel. You know, this, the, the parallel is that those who are like me in their life will share with me my, my, my glory and my victory. And you know, to, to me, I think that the, the people who desire spiritual maturity um, are desirous of fulfilling the plan of the Lord just like Jesus had that exact zeal. You're welcome. Did this, did this part make sense here? You know, when I first ran into this verb in verse 15, the, to, to see that the verb that was used um, was, an un, was an unobtainable wish. It's somebody who wishes for something that they know they'll never get. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, 
and it, it made me wonder is that why would this be an unattainable wish? You know, and I really had to think about what, what is it about the warm, what is it about the carnal believer? And I mean, this is a, these are, these are people who, uh, who are not carnal for a moment. They are people who have been so carnal that the Lord is ready to, to uh, take them to the sin and to death. There's not one thing the Lord says about them that's complimentary. So it means that they are seriously steeped in, um, in evil thinking, the thinking of the world, rather than the thinking of, of Christianity or the Bible or Jesus Christ. There's something about this, and like I said, this, this comes up in Peter. Whatever it is about it, it, it tells us that when, when, you, when you turn away from the Lord, sometime, most of the time you're not going to come back. Okay, it's, 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 it's the nature of it. In fact, I wish I, maybe I'll find it between now and the next class and, and bring it up to you. But it's where that those who have tasted, um, tasted the Lord in reality, the scripture and, and the divine life um, cannot, cannot come back and reachieve it. I'll, fi I'll find it for Sunday. Huh? It's more painful, though. Something. It's, it's more painful. It's, yeah, it's very painful. I think it's it's not only painful because of regret, but because it sounds funny. Um, it, this sounds like a strange thing to say, but because you have failed before, it is easier for you to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's right. Right. Yeah. And le unless it's crystal clear, and you have and you have fully repented of that failure and get it. The chances of you failing by that same failure are significant because it's become part of who you are. So it's very rare, car carnal believer, doing it, evil thinking over and over to recover. It. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's difficult. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. In reality, what's happened, is if, if, if you remember that big chart I had with the squares in it, when you change everything to Bible doctrine, it's, yeah. it's like the person who's gone backwards and starts erasing the Bible doctrine, and then puts the, 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 the world thinking back in there. And reality is that you are, because you have changed that one, it is more difficult to change it back. Usually that happens, I, I think one of the things that the Lord does, is many times on the sin unto death, that is the Lord's purpose of the sin unto death, is that He now has to jar you in such a way that you... Uh, that you you become aware uh, and cognizant and uh, of where you're at. Okay, and we had some of that in Revelation, where people had to have a catastrophe that happened to them for them to wake up on the fact and to and to pursue the Lord again. So, but it takes that kind of uh, uh, awakening because in reality, when you when you go back into this thinking, the blindness is even more profound. Many times, many times when people first become believers, um, and we know some of those people, many times when people first become a believer, um, they have a whole life of worldly thinking, but they are zealous to change it. And so what happens with them is that reality is they don't have that matayotes, they don't have that scar tissue on their soul. So it's easier for them to move forward than it is for somebody who has been there to 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 reclaim it because they have to take all that scar tissue that they've put on there from rejecting the Holy Spirit and the truth. Let me see if I can find that uh, scripture. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to find it, but it's a really great it's a really great piece of uh, scripture. I'll find it. Anyway, any more questions? No. Okay. No. Oh, good, good. Well, because I know that you might, you know, you're my best students. I don't expect you to have real questions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was actually going to think about leaving some questions open, but I get too excited to answer them, so it doesn't happen that way. I suppose that's not, that's not such a bad thing. 
So let's let's close so we can enjoy the rest of our evening. And as always, I'm I'm glad you guys said attend because it actually uh, does my soul good to know that you that you love the Lord and you're so interested. So let's Amen pray. That. <laughs> yeah. Dearest gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your great kindness to us that you uh, provide your word, you provide your Holy Spirit to, to help us with everything that we put before us, Lord. I pray for especially those who are here and those who will listen to this, Lord, that they'll They'll see these danger spots and how other believers in time failed so that we can use them as red flags for ourselves to, um, and actually to, uh, also to identify other believers who are in that spot and understand why they have such a struggle. I thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word. I pray that we will love it and buy more gold every day. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You're very welcome. You guys take care and we'll talk on Sunday. You too. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, see if I can turn this thing off. Oh, there we go. I found it. I knew it was here somewhere. Bye, guys. Bye.